Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this, the latest European Parliamentary Research Service Roundtable. This is part of our series of EU history roundtables when we look back at the development and evolution of the EU institutions over time. And we're delighted today to be welcoming a world class panel of uh, academics and practitioners to discuss in the shadow of Jacques Delors, the politics of European Commission presidents since the 1980s. And I start with a quotation. Since the 1980s, all European Commission presidents act and are judged in the shadow of Jacques Delors. Those words were said by one of his successors, Jose Manuel Barroso, whilst he was still holding what some commentators have described as the world's most difficult job. Indeed, there's a, a book which we haven't covered in our book talk series yet in EPRS, entitled An Impossible Job, Presidents of the European Commission. So this uh, EPRS roundtable is trying to assess what the what in today's jargon one would call the success factors or the success indicators are for commission presidents. What has been the performance of successive commission presidents since Jacques Delors, who held office from 1985 to 1995? And we're going to be asked which commission presidents have left a significant mark on the evolution of the union and why. What did Jacques Delors do? What did he achieve and how did he achieve that? Why has his tenure, ten, his tenure, tenure, exercised such a fascination on academics, commentators, and indeed politicians ever since? And is that a fair assessment? Has the Delors method been replicated by others who succeeded him? And is it still valid today? And how has the job changed over the last 40 years in an era of what Jean-Claude Juncker called a, a political commission and the current incumbent Ursula von der Leyen calls a geopolitical commission. And how is that role likely to evolve next? So today I'm delighted that we're welcomed by four people who have either uh, lived that in terms of their own professional lives or been commentating on that as an important part of their academic work. And then we'll be moving to a Q&A session in which everybody who's online, we're currently over 60 at the moment, will be able to ask questions of our panel and make comments about what they've, they've heard and uh, say their, give their perspective uh, of the evolution of the job of European Commission President. Uh, and that Q&A discussion will be moderated by Jutta Schulze-Holman, who joins us, the Director for Resources here in the European Parliamentary research service. So first of all, I'm going to ask one of the world's most preeminent historians of, of the European Union, Professor Desmond Dynan, who is Professor of Public Policy and a Jean Monnet Chair at uh, the School of Policy, Government and International Affairs at George Mason University, just outside Washington, D.C., to give uh, his perspective on the evolution of the job. He's not only uh, been the holder of his current post, he's also been a visiting professor at the College of Europe in both Bruges and in Matalin, and a senior fellow at the European University Institute in Florence. And he's written extensively on EP, EU, and institutional history more generally in a whole series of books, which are, are landmarks really in the academic literature, Ever Closer Union, an introduction to European integration, the Encyclopedia of the European Union, Europe Recast, which is a history of the evolution of the EU, and the European Union in crisis. So, Desmond Dynan, what's your view about the shadow of Jacques Delors and the evolution of the Commission presidency since he held that post? Anthony, thank you very much for the invitation to participate and for that uh, introduction. Um, what I would like to do is to explain um, the success of the Delors presidency. Um, but I will uh, make the point at the beginning and come back to it at the end that there are really two Delors presidencies. What I mean is that one can divide the period in which Delors was divided into two phases, the first of which was, was the period of great success. And after that came a period of, I don't know what to call it exactly, stalemate, setback. But I'm going to refer to the earlier period and try to explain why he was success, so successful and why he casts such a long shadow, casts such a long shadow in the future. And I think the best way to explain Dolores' success is simply to say that he was the right person in the right place at the right time. What do I mean by that? At the right time, because when he became commission president in the mid 1980s, the European community was on the cusp of a major transformation. Why was that? I think for two main reasons, one geoeconomic, the other geopolitical. 
The geoeconomic reason was the acceleration of globalization, which had begun really in the 1970s and uh, accelerated further in the mid 1980s. And that presented a tremendous opportunity to European leaders. But they could only grasp that opportunity, they realize, if they themselves integrated further. In other words, if they accelerated European integration in the context of the acceleration of globalization, then all would benefit economically from that. In addition, there were other factors, um, such as a realization on the part of European leaders of their own failures, of the failure of the recent past. They had failed to integrate in, in the 70s, which was a very difficult decade, of course, not just for the European community, but for the West economically. And I think the lesson of the failure of the past and an appreciation of the potential of the present, plus the fact that the European community was coming out of some uh, difficult, uh, or resolving some difficult issues that had just resolved the British budget dispute, for instance. So my point is that the deck was clear, really, for uh, a major transformation of the European community. And then, Almost at the same time, you had the profound geopolitical changes in Europe, notably the end of the Cold War, and that gave an opportunity to link deeper economic integration with monetary union and with so-called political union as well. And the transformation culminated in the Maastricht. And here I want to make another point, which is somewhat parenthetical, but I think important, which is that during the earlier phase of Delors' presidency, he did not face a crisis. And the reason why I say that is because it's a tendency to think, it's almost a mantra, oh, the European Union can only develop at a time of crisis and re in response to crises. It depends on the crisis. We're seeing a crisis at the moment, of course, a terrible crisis, and I think it will be an opportunity. It does present an opportunity for to integrate further. But we've seen crises in the past, perhaps the most important of which was constitutionally was the empty chair crisis, which proved disastrous for the European community for a decade to come. And Delors did not face a, a crisis. The geopolitical changes that I mentioned certainly posed a crisis to the German Democratic Republic and the Soviet Union, an existential crisis. They, they ceased to exist. But these developments presented an opportunity for the European community, and it was at a time of great opportunity that the European community integrated further. Um, other background factors which I think are important to understand is there was no Delors below De before Delors. Delors was not operating in anybody's shadow. Um, the most um, significant, I suppose, or, 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 or important president before Delors was, of course, Walter Hallstein. And his presidency had ended rather disappointingly, if not disastrously, in a confrontation with, with de Gaulle, as a result of which eventually he was forced from office. And successive commission presidents um, were, were, did not have a, have, have, have a great effect. Uh, and my point here is that expectations were, were somewhat low when Delors took over. Another background point, a contextual point, is that there were fewer member states. Um, this meant that the, there was a smaller commission, although we should remember that at the time of the Delors uh, commission, the larger member states appointed two commissioners each. But still, it was a smaller commission compared to subsequent commissions, although Delors complained about the size of the commission, especially after the accession of Spain and Portugal in 1986. Another background point, at the time, the European Parliament was relatively quiescent. I'm not saying it was not important, of course it was important, but it had not yet acquired the tremendous legislative authority and had not extended or expanded its powers of scrutiny as it would in the future, which indeed would cause problems for, or at least um, challenge future commission presidents. Um, another point is that there was relatively little concern in the mid-1980s about the democratic deficit. It doesn't mean that there was not a discussion about a, a possible democratic deficit. It simply means that the the significance of the democratic deficit and, and especially the, the challenge for the commission of, of its, its, its perceived weak legitimacy, which became a very important factor later, was not at the time of the Delors presidency. And finally, there was no competing center of institutional power in the European community at the time. Uh, after all, the standing European Council president only came into existence as a result of the Lisbon Treaty, um, which uh, was at the time Delors became president and during his presidency, there was no competing uh, center of power institutionally 
um, in, in, in the European community. In other words, um, what is now perhaps seen as a competition in the roles of the Commission President and the European Council President, although I don't want to exaggerate that, simply was not an issue because there was no standing European Council President at the time. Um, the, the second point I want to make, and I can make this very quickly, is that Delors was in the right place in, in 1984 uh, at the time when European leaders chose the next Commission President. Uh, he was available for the job, if that matters. Uh, he had been uh, in government in, in France, um, and uh, he was not quite at a loose end, but he was available. It was seen to be the turn of France, perhaps, to, pro to provide the next president, and, and he was there at that time. And now we come to being the right person. In what way was, was uh, uh, Delors the right person? First of all, he was a centrist. Uh, he was an advocate of the social market economy, which made him acceptable to all. Perhaps most important to Margaret Thatcher, because she was not an, enamored of French socialists, but she was reassured that he really was a centrist. And after all, he had been responsible for the, the famous U-turn in, 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 in French um, economic policy, um, Mitterrand's U-turn in 1983. And so she accepted him whereas she might not have otherwise if she did not know about that, that background. He was experienced in government, but it's worth noting that he was not a prime minister. And the reason why I say that is that subsequently, again, it has almost become a mantra that, oh, a successful commission president must be a prime minister. Of course, the current incumbent was not a prime minister or a chancellor either, but I think it's worth making that point. Uh, Delors came from a large member state, France, of course, and I think what's important is um, not only his past, but also his future. He was seen to have perhaps a future in French politics as a prime minister or as a president, and he cultivated that view himself because he knew that it would add to his authority. And a, a final point about his, his being the right person is that he had a grasp of economics. That's very important because, of course, the main projects during his presidency were economic projects. And here I come to those projects because I think another um, reason why it's 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 uh, our way of understanding uh, the significance of, of the Delors presidency is that Delors appreciated the importance of a project around which he could build political support, business support, the support of organized labor, which was quite important to him, especially given his background, and public support. And he quickly understood, given the context that I already described, that the main project around which he could build such a support or around which such support already existed was completion of the single market or of the internal market. After all, there was a political consensus amongst um, national leaders as disparate as Thatcher, Mitterrand and Cole on the value of completing the internal market. Um, big business supported the completion of the internal market. Um, there was potential public support, which I think came to the fore a little later in the 1990s. And also, this was a project around which he could bring the support of, um, or mobilize the support of organized labor. Um, also important to Delors was that this particular project, completing the single market, would have to have at its core the commission and the commission yeah. president, meaning yes. it would require the commission to provide a blueprint for the completion of the single market, which, he did, which it did with the famous Cofield White Paper. And then implementation of the single market would require a heavy legislative agenda, and needless to say, the Commission would be central to that. So I, I think Delors was very clever in identifying exactly the project um, which, which, was, which was necessary at the time and around which he could mobilize support, but he was equally clever in linking that project, the single market program, to treaty change. And this was not a given. We're inclined to look back and think, oh, yes, completion of the single market program inevitably required the single European Act. It did not. But Delors and others argued that it did, that a treaty change was necessary. And of course, by convincing others of that and indeed bringing about or helping to bring about the intergovernmental conference that resulted in the single European Act, Delors was able to widen the agenda beyond the single market and include other policy initiatives as as well as other as well as institutional changes which would further deepen European integration. And here I think one of the key factors in understanding Delors' success is that he appreciated the importance of the European Council. He knew that key decisions would be taken in the European Council and he acted very effectively in the European Council almost as a head of state or government himself. He was seen to be on a par 
really with the, the leading members of the European Council, especially the leaders of France and Germany. And indeed, it was in the European Council that an agreement was reached to hold an intergovernmental conference. It was during that intergovernmental conference that Delors excelled and the Commission excelled in presenting proposals, uh, many of which were incorporated, of course, into the single European Act. And I think Delors' influence in the concluding summit of the first intergovernmental conference on, on major treaty change resulting in the single European Act, the European Council in December 1985 was decisive. Delors then switched his attention to the next project, Economic and Monetary Union, which was really his, his main project. And here again, I think he was very clever at linking the success of the single market program with the need for um, monetary union. And in fact, his argument was one of neo-functionalist spillover in academic terms, um, with with the the slogan um, epitomized perhaps in the slogan "One market, one money." Now, one could argue whether in fact monetary union was necessary in order in order to consolidate the single market, but he argued very successfully that it was. And again, he succeeded within the European Council in setting up the Delors Committee, and I think that's a major achievement of the Delors Commission. Uh, because what what Delors did within the um, uh, with the, the, the committee of central bank governors is present central bank governors and presidents of the member states with an intellectual challenge. How would you go about building or designing a a, a single currency? And even those who were not enamoured of the project became very enthusiastic intellectually in uh, about the project. And what came out of that, of course, was then the blueprint for the provisions within the Maastricht Treaty on Economic and Monetary Union. And then finally, I think Delors very um, ably seized upon the, the, the geopolitical changes that were taking place in 1989 and 1990 to build on the momentum for Economic and Monetary Union, a project which was already in train at the time, but may not have been successful without the added impetus of the profound changes that took place in 1989 and 1990. Um, and that led, of course, to the new intergovernmental conference and to the uh, Maastricht Treaty. So if I could conclude with these points, which have to do really with leadership style, what can we say about his leadership style? Clearly, Delors had razor sharp focus, complete uh, dedication to a particular project, um, and he was unrelenting in the pursuit of an objective. Was he ideolog ideological? Well, I described him as being a centrist, center left, maybe by French standards, really center right, Christian democratic by German standards. But Delors' real ideology, rather like Monet's, was the ideology of efficiency. That's what he was really committed to, and that's what he saw as being all important. He was a good judge of talent and of ability. He put together a very good cabinet, of course, under the uh, strong leadership of, uh, of, of, of Lamy. Uh, he was a good communicator um, in French, um, uh, not so much in, in other languages, but, but in his speeches in French and, and his interviews in French, I think communicated well the projects that, that, that he sought to pursue. But I will say this, he was not a good manager, also like Jean Monnet, by the way. And I think that left a legacy within the commission um, that uh, future commission presidents had to deal with. And to wrap up, I would say, as I said at the beginning, um, that Delors' long presidency over 10 years from 1985 to, to 1995 can really be divided into two parts. The highly successful presidency of 1985 to 1989, which is quite a short period when you think about it, and then a period thereafter of, as I said, not, not quite stalemate, but for Delors, certain setbacks. And what really brings this home to me and I think this is somewhat poignant, is Delors' speech at the College of Europe in 1989. And you may recall that he made that speech in response to a speech which Margaret Thatcher had given only the year before. And Delors saw his speech in 1989 as a rebuttal of, of, of Thatcherism, if you like, and, and of the Euroscepticism um, uh, personified by, by Thatcher. And for Delors, this was, this was a moment of great triumph. But looking back now, you can see that this was the high watermark of the Delors presidency. And after that, Delors influence, I would say, waned. Thank you. Well, thank you, Desmond, for setting the scene so elegantly. And um, 
and intellectually um, stimulate in such an intellectually stimulating way. Um, of course, there was something of it, maybe not a dramatic immediate crisis in Europe at that time in the mid 80s, but there was a slow burn longer term and very corrosive crisis, which was known as um, Eurosclerosis. And in a way, Delors genius was to provide a solution to relaunch Europe through a supply side reform process that re-energized the European economy. And um, that was that created political momentum of an extraordinary kind. And the parliament, of course, it may not have been powerful at that time, but it was certainly very supportive of every aspect of what you've just described from the single market through to the single currency and everything uh, in between. And I think the parliament's contribution was not marginal. It was significant. But it wasn't uh, as legislatively important as subsequently, of course, the parliament was to become. Now, to carry that story forward and look at how the shadow of Dolores interacted with successive uh, presidents uh, that have uh, succeeded uh, Jacques Delors, we're delighted to be joined by Sophia Ruzak, who's uh, one of the key researchers in institutions here in Brussels. She works at the Brussels based think tank, the Centre for European policy studies, where her research interests lie in EU democracy, institutional architecture and decision making. And she's the um, author of a, a slew of pamphlets and monographs on different aspects of EU decision making and institutions. For example, recently representative and deliberative, deliberative democracy in the EU, EU parliamentary democracy, the effects of COVID on the EU institutions and crisis decision making in the European Union. And she's recently been doing a doctorate at Maastricht University on um, Jean-Claude Juncker's uh, political commission. So over to Sophia. Yeah, thank you very much, Anthony, for the invitation and for this warm welcome. Um, I would like to contribute to this debate um, about in speaking precisely about that. So the term of Commission President Juncker and uh, particularly to talk about the label of the political commission. And uh, I will do so in three steps. First, I will speak about what it actually meant for the commission to be political, what elements did it entail? Then in the second step, uh, what effects it had on the college and on the role of the president. And then in the third step, um, I will broaden the angle a little bit um, and speak about a historical trend of the politicization of the commission. So you see, it's a very, um, it's not an assessment in policy terms, but it's a very, you know, institutional angle that I'm taking. So my first point, what is a political commission? I found that throughout the mandate, there was a lot of debate what it actually means uh, and whether um, it is at odds with yeah, the commission's role as a guardian of the treaty, where it of course has to be neutral and impartial. But I found that was, there was very little communication from the commission itself to the, ex to the outside world, but also internally from what I've heard about what it actually really meant. And uh, it entailed two aspects. And the first one was a prioritization of policies. And the second one, a top down decision making approach. Regarding the policy priorities, um, the commission, the Juncker commission wanted to, you know, kind of refuse to simply accept the orders of other institutions, EI member states, and, you know, rather underline its own agenda setting function. And has and that has been implemented by which we all know the 10 points agenda that he set up uh, defining 10 policy fields in which the Commission would and did have, um, predominantly not only but predominantly would act. Um, and by the way, Barroso also in issued such political um, guidelines as required by the Lisbon Treaty, in fact. Uh, but if you look at this document, then it is, you know, looking at the, the structure and the length, and it does make the impression that it didn't really target the wider public. And indeed, um, it was not very much known. And by contrast, Juncker's guidelines, of course, uh, were promoted very actively, and I think they could hardly escape the attention of any observer of EU politics. So I would argue that Juncker did not just fulfill this, you know, contractual treaty duty to um, set up those guidelines, but he really used them to uh, structure his work and to communicate his goals to the outside world. So uh, that is quite a novum, I find. Mm, and then the second aspect that, or the second element of the political commission was this application of the top-down approach. And so here, I mean, we know that traditionally the, the um, 
the DGs, the, the services, they have a quite strong agenda setting role in the commission and Juncker wanted to, you know, give this a different spin and wanted to uh, give decision making authority rather to the politicians than to the officials and also, of course, streamline the work of the commission. Mm. And that and that has been implemented um, with a new internal structure. So he introduced his project teams. Um, so this means that commissioners came to, from, from, from different policy fields, re related portfolios came together um, and were each headed by one vice president. So he wanted to facilitate that commissioners um, come together to discuss dossiers from different policy angles. And the vice presidents were supposed to have some kind of yeah, a team leader, but also a gatekeeper function. Okay, so this is kind of how the commission in very broad line, the Juncker commission, the political commission in very broad line institutionally looked like. And now my second point, what were the effects of this? And um, the effects that it had on the role and the, on the role of the president, the college was certainly that the college became less collegial. These, pro these, these um, policy um, project teams, they, Formally, I mean, that preceded the usual decision making proce procedure and decisions were still, of course, formally made by the college. Um, but everything was kind of pre cooked in those teams. So compromise was reached long before actually um, uh, files would go into college and hardly any decisions were changed once they were made in the project teams. And that, of course, gave very little room for for debate. Um, and so in the college meetings, there was much more political communication discussed than actually policy substance. And that also meant that commissioners were less informed about what's going on at the commission. Um, the, the goal was more team play and that was achieved in those policy families. But outside these families, uh, commissioners were less aware of what's happening across the commission. And that one could argue is a bit problematic because Commissioners, of course, have some kind of ambassador function in their own member states, right? I mean, they go and they speak in their mother tongue about what the commission does, what the EU does, outside, also outside their own portfolio. So that is, of course, limited then. A lot of members of the college have felt left out. There was kind of a core and some were naturally closer to the core and some, uh, some not. And those that were closer were not necessarily the vice presidents. Um, we see a stronger centralization and a stronger presidentialization under Juncker. Um, and I mean, these are long term trends, as I think my colleagues on the panel will probably confirm that we've seen this already for for a while going on. Um, so while considering that it is, of course, impossible to discuss high um, complex, very complex portfolios among 27 members of the college, um, still, of course, what you know might be problematic about this kind of front loading approach um, is that it does interfere with the principle of collegiality. Um, and generally speaking, collegiality and presidentialization are, of course, at odds, naturally, because the more power to the president, the less to the college. Um, and the collegial decision making is, of course, you know, it is important to, or it is a kind of a facilitator. Uh, for acting in the general interest. So that now I would like to kind of zoom out a little bit for my third point, um, zooming out of the Junkers uh, term to speak about the politicization of the commission also as a longer term trend. Um, because I think if we want to assess the political commission, then it is very important that we look at, you know, where the commission started, you know, its inception as a technocratic institution and also, the profound changes that have been, you know, ongoing, especially after the Treaty of Maastricht. Mm. So, in the very, in the very beginning of, of EU integration, decision making uh, was very uh, technocratic and it was very elite driven, right? Um, and so was the Commission. That was the modus, modus operandi by that time, and it was intentionally. Um, in in um, Monet's conception, a political commission was was not desirable. Um, you know, a, a, I mean, back then, high authority it was seen as flawed. It would have, a political commission was seen as flawed because it might have been, you know, prone to actions to actors who um, who are short sighted, self seeking, and who thereby then undermine its legitimacy. So, therefore, the 
commission was intentionally designed as an independent body, isolated, somewhat isolated from politics to fulfill this neutral role uh, and to be trusted with uh, indeed enforcing the law. But back then there was also no democracy concern. Um, the EU, I mean, Desmond already touched upon this and I would like to highlight this again. I mean, the EU was kind of sufficiently legitimized via its output, um, delivering satisfying policy results. Projects like the single markets were met with widespread approval. And, uh, you know, and, and a term that we use in political science, a permissive consensus, so a disinterested agreement to whatever happens on EU level. That was the time of that permissive consensus pre Maastricht. And then Maastricht happened, um, a treaty which is widely um, uh, labeled as a watershed moment of EU integration. And why is that? Uh, because it meant a significant integration step. That was met with skepticism and distrust among the EU uh, population. So pre Maastricht, um, integration was mainly happening in economic field, as Desmond also already said, creating and competing the single market as a key project. And then with Maastricht, we saw deeper integration, we saw more political integration, and also integration in those fields that are closer to national sovereignty, such as the monetary union. Um, so as a consequence. There was much, there was politicization, EU politicization increasing, so much more awareness, but also polarization, a um, political climate which was increasingly hostile towards EU integration and less support, um, which for the first time then was exemplified in the Danish refusal of the Maastricht Treaty. That was for the first time such instance. instance. Um, so, and here is, you know, this is where what Desmond also said already, the demo, the notion of the democratic, democratic deficit that was born by that time. And that, you know, in turn also, of course, affected directly the commission because the image of the unaccount, unaccountable technocratic elite was, and also still is, you know, at, at the heart of this democratic deficit claim. Um, and then certainly, of course, the, the mass resignation of the Santa Commission in 1999 uh, did not help in this. So the solution was to introduce new sources of legitimacy. And here, of course, most obviously, the parliament was gradually strengthened. But also, not only was the parliament as an institution strengthened, it was also tied closer to the commission to make the commission more accountable to the parliament. And that entails, and I mean, nowadays, that means that before the commission comes into office, the parliament has to approve the college after hearings. It also means that during the mandate, the, um, the parliament can ask, can raise parliamentary questions, and also commissioners have to appear regularly uh, before committees in plenary and are obliged to report. Um, and then finally, of course, um, they also, the parliament also has the option to issue a no confidence vote, so to force the commission to collectively step down. And Juncker's appointment procedure, the lead candidate procedure, that can be argued was a further continuation of such trend. So long story short, the trigger for the evolution for a more political commission were the demands for a more for more democratic EU governance since the Treaty of Maastricht. Um, so I'm, I'm concluding by saying that on the backdrop of the trends of politicization, presidentialization and centralization within the commission, Juncker certainly didn't reinvent the wheel, but he has introduced a novel way of organizing his commission. And that, by the way, has also been uh, largely adopted by the current commission president. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Sophia. Thank you for um, bringing us more up to date and also giving us an insight into what we might call the Juncker method, which, as you say, to some degree, has been carried forward into the von der Leyen Commission, uh, based upon a kind of political mandate and political guidelines and more top-down decision-making inside the Commission, and perhaps team play, as you say, among uh, small groups of commissioners rather than a, a collegiate approach as a whole. And um, Desmond, who's introduced us more to the um, Delors method, which was essentially uh, about a kind of neo-functionalist process of showing how one major policy initiative automatically or at least logically could lead to another and building political momentum through that process. 
and crucially interacting with heads of state and government and leveraging the European Council as the vehicle to get Europe moving. Now, we've heard from two uh, academics who've written widely on different aspects of EU decision making in EU history. Uh, we're now going to go to uh, Dr. Martin Westlake, who's visiting professor at the College of Europe in Bruges and also at the London School of Economics, European Institute. And he's uh, both in effect an academic and uh, a seasoned practitioner, worked in the Council of Europe, in the Council of Minister the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, the Council of Ministers uh, Secretariat in Brussels, and then in the European Commission for quite a while before becoming uh, finally Secretary General of the Economic and uh, Social Committee. And he saw the Commission very much uh, on the inside during the glory years of the Delors period and beyond. Martin, what's your perception of this? Um, thank you very much, Anthony, and thank you um, to the European Parliamentary Research Service for organising this truly fascinating walk down memory lane. Um, um, and a lot of the events that have been recalled by Desmond and Sof Sophia bring back uh, memories of one sort or another. I'd like to start with an anecdote, if I may. In 1985, I was walking down uh, Rue Belliard outside the European Parliament. I'd just come from um, the European University Institute in Florence, where, um, together with Joe Weiler, we set up what was to become the Schumann Centre. And we'd organised a big conference on the draft treaty establishing the European Union that Altiero Spinelli had led in the European Parliament and that the Parliament had adopted. And if I'm not mistaken, Antti, it's where you and I first met. Um, but anyway, I was walking down the Rue Belliard and I bumped into Joe Weiler and we were looking around for another idea for a big conference. And I said to Joe, what about um, a conference on the presidents of the European Commission? And Joe shook his head sadly and said, no, Martin, apart from Hal Stein and maybe Jenkins, who would there be? Now, today, this conference that you've organised, it makes perfect sense and seems perfectly logical. And that in itself, I, one could argue, is a Delors effect. Who now remembers Jean Ray, Franca, Franca Maria Malfatti, uh, François Xavier Ortelier and Gaston Thorne? I'm not suggesting that they did nothing. On the contrary, they did a lot. But it's not just because of the distance of time that we don't really talk about them that much. I think Desmond is absolutely correct to argue that there was a Halstein effect. Now, today I'm painting with a broad brush. Um, and indeed, I'd like to talk to, uh, to the theme of what uh, Sophia called trends. Uh, and in a, sense, in a sense, the trends that led from Delors to Juncker and indeed to Ursula von der Leyen's commission. Um, and I talk knowing that David, who lived through a lot of this literally at the coalface, will correct me if I get things wrong. But anyway, I'd like using my broad brush, I'd like to characterize the Commission presidents since the Delors presidencies into two categories. Those who had principally to clean up afterwards and those who were able to use the cleanup to begin to relaunch the Commission. And this is very unfair on Romano Prodi, but I'll explain why, because he belonged as much to the second category as he did to the first. Now, I don't mean that the Delors commissions made a mess. Far from it. The Delors presidencies went very far, very fast. In retrospect, they achieved an extraordinary amount. Just whilst we were um, uh, underway now, I, I looked on Wiki at the last two years of the Delors presidency, and these are the major events in 1993 and 1994. So the single European market entered into force, the Maastricht Treaty was ratified, the European Monetary Institute was established, the forerunner of the European Central Bank, the European Economic Area entered into force, the Committee of the Regions was established, accession negotiations for Austria, Norway, Sweden and Finland were concluded, the European Investment Fund was established and Hungary and Poland applied to join. Now, that's an awful lot of history underway just in those last two years of the Delors um, presidencies. Um, but the achievements um, uh, came at a sort of a price. In part, this had to do with the brilliant way in which the achievements were, were, were made. Um, there were sort of counter structures within the administration. There was brilliant improvisation, lots of big picture stuff, more attention to development and less to implementation, perhaps inevitably and always pushing at the boundaries whilst the window of opportunity lasted. 
Um, and what that meant, in effect, was that whoever the, the next European Commission president had been, um, in the event it was Jacques Santerre, they would have needed to take stock and catch up and start to concentrate also on the administrative side of things. And indeed, under Jacques Santerre, the Commission did try, under Jacques Santerre and David's predecessor as Secretary General, David Williamson. Um, I'm sorry to in indulge in uh, acronyms, but being a, an old lag, I can't resist calling up to David's memory, MAP 2000, um, Modernization of Administration and Personnel Policy from 1997, and the dreaded DECODE, which was Dessiner la Commission de Demain, also of 1997. And there was a, an excellent Finnish Commissioner for the Budget and Human Resources, Erki Lipanen, who went on to become Finland's central bank governor, um, who did an excellent job. But of course, history caught up in a way with the Santé Commission in 1999 and the um, uh, mass resignation that Sophia referred to. And I would argue that what was happening in the background to all of this was the looming um, process of enlargement, of ever greater enlargement. Um, and we shouldn't forget either that in that period of 1989, 1990, Yugoslavia was also beginning to fall apart, which inevitably meant in the longer term, and the law knew that full well, um, that there would be other future member states knocking at the door. So Romano Prodi was, to my mind, a key figure of transition um, from what, again, using shorthand, I would say is a transition from the charismatic to the technocratic. Now, I'm not talking so much about the individuals, but about the administrative approaches of the commissions involved. Prodi, it's true he had the support, if I'm not mistaken, he had very broad support in the European Parliament, the three main groups. Um, he had um, in his vice president, Neil Killock, who was responsible for administrative reform, um, a big beast in the jungle, as it were. And together with uh, Michele Schreyer, who was responsible for the budget, they drove through a package of reforms that basically made the commission fit for purpose and it enabled the commission to face up to the challenges ahead. And indeed, at the time, I think it was The Economist magazine that first coined the phrase that R Romano Prodi was the first Prime Minister of the European Commission, by which they meant that he was the first who really took professionalization and managerialism seriously. And part of that was programming, particularly the linkage between resources and activities. I don't want to say too much because I'm treading on David's toes because he was responsible for a huge amount of this. But I do remember one of my um, bosses telling me um, in the 1980s that the classic way of getting a policy up and running in the European Commission was to get it up and running first. And once you got it up and running, then you got the resources for it. Well, of course, that was turned around under the Prodi um, uh, Commission in particular. But Prodi was also part of the relance, uh, the relaunching of the European Commission. On his watch, we had the Amsterdam Treaty. The euro was introduced in 99, 1999. And I think coins and notes came into being in 12 of the 15 member states in 2002. Um, we had the Nice Treaty. Um, and we had, of course, towards the end, the enlargements of 2004. Um, enlargement, I say, as a trend inevitably led to presidentialization um, of the European um, Commission. Um, I won't go into massive detail, but inevitably, if you have a commission that consists, I think by the end of the first Barroso Commission, there were 25 commissioners. It's a very different kettle, kettle of fish to managing a commission of, I don't know, 12, uh, 15. Um, so um, in treaty, various treaty changes, this process of president, presidentialization took place. Um, notably with the Nice Treaty, finally, um, the Commission President could call for the resignation of commissioners if he so requested, he or she so requested, and could also reshuffle portfolios. And also extra treaty changes, such as the one that um, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso introduced in 2004, whereby the Secretariat General of the European Commission became a service attached to the President of the European Commission and was no longer therefore um, so much a guarantor of collegiality, which had been its primary purpose before, but was now something like a cabinet office. Um, and indeed, if one looks further forward to the reforms that Sophia, Sophia was talking about, um, this idea of clusters of commissioners, of senior vice presidents, 
of filtering. All of these were responses in effect to the ongoing trend of enlargement. Lastly, if I may, um, Anthony, if I still have time, just a few words about the, the, the term politicization has been mentioned a few, a few times. Now, it's true that under the law, there was talk about a more political commission, um, but I don't think it was very deep um, uh, or serious stuff. At the time, of course, there were big um, beasts in the socialist, on the socialist side of things. There was François Mitterrand himself, um, after the enlargement, there was Felipe González in Spain, there was Mario Suárez in Portugal, um, there was Bettino Craxi in Italy, and Kinnock was seen, Neil Kinnock was seen as being a future um, Prime Minister, probably of the UK. So there was a sense that maybe the socialists were on the roll, but I think there was more of that sense in the European Parliament than there was in the European Commission itself, which remained broadly a technocratic um, um, body. But I think one of the key um, elements in the politicization of the European Commission, which has been overlooked perhaps, was the synchronization of the terms of office of the European Commission and the European Parliament in 1993. In retrospect, it's extraordinary to think that they weren't synchronized, but believe it or not, they weren't until 1993. So um, all of a sudden, there was a sort of a symbiotic link between the European Commission and the European Parliament. And then in the, uh, what one could call perhaps the socialist heyday um, in the European Parliament, um, um, uh, there was a building sense on the side, and Anthony knows more about this than I do surely coming from the Parliament, but there was a building sense of frustration among the European People's Party in particular, which would later spill over into the enlargement process itself where eventually the EPP became the largest group. Now, um, it just so happens that I have in my possession a photocopy of a brochure that was written by a certain Klaus Vella, uh, who was then, I believe, Secretary General of the EPP in the European Parliament. And the title of his um, pamphlet, which was published in 1997, but it illustrates well the point I want to make, is, must the European Parliament be dominated by the socialists? So that was the sort of feeling that was abroad still in the 1990s in the European Parliament. Fast forward to the 2000s and the Treaty on the Future, the Convention on the Future of Europe, and the EPP had a lot of, uh, done a lot of serious thinking, which effectively resulted in a forerunner of the Spitzenkandidaten procedure. But the Esteril Congress of the European People's Party, this idea of a lead candidate was first seriously addressed and indeed treaty amendments were drawn up and submitted to the conference. And um, the first Barroso and certainly the second Barroso commissions, um, Barroso claimed and certainly the EPP claimed that he was their Spitzenkandidat and that he had been appointed in part as a result of the elections. Um, coming forward, and I'll finish here, the European Commission is still political today, of course, but coming back to what Sophia said, it's political now in a different sense. Um, and um, I'm grateful to somebody who doesn't want his name to be said, but PC are his initials, who explained to me his idea that now presidents of the European Commission, certainly Juncker and von der Leyen, have become more like um, prime ministers of a governing coalition rather than um, the uh, presidents of the Commission back in the 1980s who were in charge, it's true, of an array of different political colours but were essentially um, based around a technocratic approach um, to the integration process, rather than a political one, which responded to the environment around it, including the crises that um, Desmond mentioned, um, and also the elections that so Sophia mentioned, um, and also the demands of these two um, beasts that have been growing in size and influence ever since the Delors era, on the one hand, the European Parliament, and on the other, the European Council. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Martin, and thank you for weaving that very rich tapestry, which combines uh, your perspectives, both from uh, academia and from uh, multiple years in, in practice. And um, I'd just like to um, say that to, in case there's any misunderstanding, it is not the case that Martin and I first met on the Rue Belliard. I think we, <laughs> we met in the corridors, rather dreary corridors of the Council of Ministers 
building at that point in the uh, Batimont Charlemagne, uh, but it turned out to be a, a very fortuitous uh, encounter and one which has been very productive over the years ever since. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, for combining those two perspectives. Now we come perhaps to the uh, practitioner par excellence in the Brussels system, David O'Sullivan. And we're very, very grateful for David for joining us. And we're very privileged, in fact, to have him as part of this conversation. We're now uh, over 90 people online. Uh, after David's spoken, there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers uh, and comments from the digital floor. So please already be thinking about uh, what messages you would like to communicate and then signal those in the Q&A function. David is going to share with us his many years of experience at the heart of EU decision making. Of course, most recently, he was the EU's ambassador to the United States. He was previously chief operating officer of the External Action Service. And in the European Commission, he held a variety of very significant and important roles. Director General for Trade, uh, Chief of Staff to a Commission President, Romano uh, Prodi, and Secretary General of the Commission itself. And before that, all of that, he was also in two commissioners uh, cabinet. So he's seen pretty much everybody at, at close hand that we've been talking about during this uh, period, during this seminar. He's seen them in action, trying to define agendas, make policy, and to um, shape the future of Europe. David. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anthony. And thank you really uh, to the previous speakers who've done, I think, a fantastic job. I, I particularly, if I may say so, no, no offense to Sophia and Martin, but uh, Desmond, I thought your, your description of the Delors era was, was masterly um, and very much captured the, the, the spirit of, of that time. Um, I joined the European Commission in, in 1979. And I just wanted to uh, pick up uh, a point that Anthony made in response to Desmond, who said there there wasn't a crisis. In fact, there was a crisis. Uh, the, the 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 process was moribund, and there was a strong sense of pessimism in the corridors of the early more. I was in the external relations uh, DG. In fact, my first job, believe it or not, was was relations between the the EEC and Comic Con. Right? And not too many people even remember what Comic Con was. And this was certainly not a dossier that was fast moving uh, or, or, or destined uh, to achieve greatness anytime soon. But there was a strong sense of a, a loss of direction. And I, I then went uh, to the delegation in Tokyo, uh, where we had the sort of trade wars with Japan. And I must say that for me was the moment of deep conviction about European integration. I mean, I'd been to the College of Europe, I'd kind of done the, 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 the traditional parkour. But what really convinced me was when I was in Japan and I saw the way that Asia viewed Europe at that time, which basically was as a museum, uh, a nice place to visit to, to, to see the old sites, but with little future. And, and that was very much the mood that Delors was able to tap into. Now, as you know, he, he actually had several ideas for a great leap forward of European integration, uh, one of which was monetary union, another which was security and defense, and another of which was, was the single market. And he kind of market tested these with, um, uh, the heads of state and government and quickly decided uh, that the single market was the most promising. Uh, uh, but it was not that he came intending to, with, with that in mind, uh, and he himself would often point out that when he was appointed as president of the commission, he got, I think, you know, two column in inches on the, the third page of, of, of Le Monde uh, uh, and, and almost nowhere else. So it wasn't even regarded uh, at that time as a particularly uh, important role in grand European politics. Now, he transformed that uh, in the way that, that Desmond has described. And I, I think it certainly was the right man in the right place at the right time. We should not detract from his enormous personal qualities uh, and, and his determinism, his, 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 his capacity for detail, uh, exactly as Desmond says, his ability to surround himself uh, with talented people, which is always a test of, of a good leader and, and people who, who are successful. Uh, so he had all those qualities and, and and he did you know achieve the two greatest things probably that we've ever achieved namely uh, the single market and the single currency now the difficulty for everybody coming after him was uh, you know follow that act right 
and every single commission president afterwards would turn to their advisors, and sometimes I was in the room, saying, what's my legacy? What am I going to do that will leave that kind of legacy? But to be honest, there never quite was the same thing again to be found. Uh, because the European Union, we moved into much more complex areas of, of, of future integration. Uh, and frequently we were, we were firefighting crises rather than moving the project forward. Uh, and this was the, 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 the dilemma, I think, which, which uh, all subsequent presidents have faced uh, uh, is how do you, what is your, your, your contribution to, to the building? Now, in, in practice, as has been indicated uh, both by, by, by Martin and, and Sophia, in practice, it has moved forward, but it's less attributable to the initiative of any one person at any given time. I, I, that's the difference. I, I think uh, Delors' amazing um, capacity to mix the technocratic and the political uh, was crucial in, in what he was able to do, but he was doing it in areas, as Desmond said, where the commission was the, the uh, uh, indispensable element. You couldn't do any of this stuff without a functioning commission and without the commission uh, delivering. And, and that, was, that was the great advantage. Subsequently, much of the stuff is less self-evidently in the exclusive power of the commission. It's much more shared competences with member states, it's foreign policy, it's justice and home affairs. Uh, it's area. It, it's it's much less obvious that the commission has to be at the centre. The other thing I would say is that there was a pushback after Delors uh, against the commission, because many many heads of state and government felt, oh, we've created a bit of a, you know, we, we've created Frank, we're, we're Frankenstein, and we've created a monster. Uh, uh, we 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 don't want this all powerful uh, commission. Uh, we don't want to turn the commission into the government of Europe. Uh, 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 and we want the um, European Council, we want the, the member states to be much more in control. At the same time, there was the development of the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, Desmond is absolutely right to say that the European Parliament uh, in, in, in the Delors time, Delors paid a lot of attention to it. I was in the, the cabinet of Peter Sutherland, actually responsible at that time for relations with the European Parliament, uh, and did with um, Sir Christopher Plum the 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 implementation of the single act new 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 legislative procedure with uh, with the, the European Parliament. Peter Sutherland took it seriously, but honestly, most people in the Commission and most member states did not yet see the Parliament as absolutely key, and the Parliament has its own story of how it has battled its way to become uh, the, the co-legislator that it now is and to have the, the power and influence that, that it rightly has, 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 has delivered, has, has achieved. So these two things squeeze, have squeezed the Commission, uh, the, 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 the desire of Member States, particularly the idea that President of the Commission had to be a, a former Prime Minister. The reason for that was uh, member states wanted to feel this was someone who would understand them uh, and who would be sympathetic to their dilemmas because they, they felt frequently that um, uh, Delors was perhaps not always fully appreciative of their dilemmas. In fact, he was appreciative of, of their dilemmas. He just felt that they, they had to overcome them rather they couldn't become, an, they shouldn't be an obstacle. Um, the, the other thing then, of course, which is important is um, uh, the, the point that Desmond made and then Martin and others picked up, uh, the fact that the Commission, until that, until the, the end of the law era, was basically a policy, uh, concept, a policy conception place. It was about designing policy. It was not much about implementing stuff. Uh, and all the stuff which was decided uh, uh, in, in uh, the single act and in, in Maastricht, needed to be implemented, in particular, the, the funds, the cohesion funds, the large amount of money that, that suddenly needed to be managed. And everyone knew that the Commission needed to be reformed as an organization, as an administration. And Delors kept on saying he was going to reform the Commission. I remember very well at the end of his first mandate, he said, now, I'm next, for my next four years, I'm going to, I'm going to reform the Commission. And then he had then he had Maastricht and he was too busy. And then he had his last two years and he said, well, I, I would reform the commission, but I don't have time. Uh, so basically, uh, he never reformed the commission. 
uh, and it fell to Santerre to try to do that, and uh, he did try. Um, but of course, we know that the rest is history because uh, the parliament was determined on flexing its muscles uh, uh, and uh, used the opportunity presented by some of the mismanagement that was that was present uh, to flex its muscles and basically to more or less force the resignation of, of the Santerre Commission, which was a, a very unfair stain on that on that college and on President Santerre because he was actually trying to 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 reform the commission, and the consequence of that. When when Brody arrived, uh, was firstly that there had to be a root and branch administrative reform of the commission, which I think has by and large been quite successful, uh, and I think the commission is you know now uh, uh, a, a, a rather efficient and and well run and 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 value for money bureaucracy by by by, by comparison of public services around the world, but there was a deep um, drawing up of suspicion between. The, the professional staff and the, the, the commissioners. Um, the, the narrative that commissioners took from the fall of the Chanter Commission was that it was the officials who let them down by not following all the rules uh, and that uh, uh, they, they were the victims of it. The, the narrative officials took was we're hardworking officials dedicated to the future of Europe and we've been let down by politicians who've tried to play uh, silly buggers around the rules. Uh, and this is a legacy that I, I think we're still facing. Uh, uh, I, I noticed that you, you increasingly you get commissioners when they come to Brussels, their first thing is, I'm not going to be run by the officials. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show who's in charge. And, and Delors' great ability was actually to harness uh, some of the best brains in the commission and bring them with them. And he often worked directly with directors general and directors uh, over the heads or behind the back of, of the commissioners sometimes because he understood he needed that technical expertise. But there was, I think, during the time of Prodi and to a certain extent into Barroso, a kind of breach of trust between the college and 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 the staff, which uh, in my view has not been completely, completely repaired for, for, for the reason I mentioned. Then, of course, you had enlargement, uh, and uh, uh, enlargement definitely changed the nature of the college. Uh, and I, I think, indisputably, you went towards greater presidentialization. I had actually proposed to uh, Barroso when he arrived the model of vice presidents and clusters. Uh, uh, I had suggested three models. One was the status quo, so you continued with the way the commission had always run. The second was uh, a complete um, vice presidentialization of the, of the commission. In other words, you would divide the commissioners into groups and you would put a, a, a vice president in charge of each group uh, and they would be basically responsible. So you'd have an inner, an inner group of commissioners, of vice presidents and the president who would basically run the college with uh, other commissioners having a, a role, but a less decisive role, or some kind of hybrid version. Um, I, I don't know what President Barroso, you know, he, he once told me that he, he was he was attracted by some of the ideas, uh, but in the end, the liberal group in the parliament got wind of this and said that under no circumstances would they approve a president who had any intention of creating differentiation between commissioners. Uh, and the, the, the plan was abandoned and then was dusted off by Martin Selmar uh, uh, many years later with the arrival of himself and, and Jean-Claude Juncker and, and more or less followed the model which I had designed back then uh, in, 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 2000, in 2004. And the point being that all of this was how do you grapple with having too many commissioners? Uh, and we know that there are too many commissioners. There is not enough work to go around. Uh, this leads frequently to commissioners becoming almost like directors general uh, and, and having to dabble in the details, and in particular their cabinets perhaps dabbling too much in the detail. Um, the, treat, the, the Lisbon Treaty, of course, foresaw a reduction in the number of commissioners. I'm afraid my compatriots did for that project by uh, when they voted against uh, the, Lisbon, the Lisbon Treaty for the first time, uh, because in Ireland we always like to vote for these things twice. Uh, and one of the casualties of, of the second referendum was a, a, a commitment to keep uh, one commissioner per member state, which we know doesn't work, frankly. I, I, it, it, it is very difficult to make the college function in that way. Uh, therefore, you have emptied effectively the, the college meetings of any policy discussion. Everything is, is pre-cooked. Pre uh, much more power to the president. And by the way, I don't disagree with that. Uh, I, I think that is perhaps uh, uh, the way it had to go. 
Um, but I, I think it, it, it would be better to do it with a smaller number of commissioners and still have some degree of collegiality uh, rather than the way we, 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 it, it operates now. Um, what's the final conclusion? I mean, my conclusion is that I think all of the, the people who followed the law in their own way made huge contributions, important contributions uh, to, to European integration, and you, you, you can go through it. Um, sometimes in, in, the case of, in the case of Prodi, I think it was administrative reform which had to be done, which was painful and a bit boring, but had to be done, and it was enlargement. Uh, which was a, a, a very significant uh, achievement. Um, Barroso uh, uh, had the sort of consolidation of, of enlargement uh, and had to deal then with uh, the, the beginnings of the crisis, uh, which dominated his second his second mandate. So it was a, it was very much reactive. Uh, uh, and then we, we, you had uh, Jean Claude Juncker, who also faced you know a string of crises during his presidency, uh, which he weathered with, in my view, great skill. Uh, and and now we have von der Leyen, who is uh, once again, uh, you know, uh, seems to me that, that a great president, though I think she is, and I genuinely have enormous regard for how she's managed it. She also has faced nothing but crises since the day she walked in the door, right? Uh, uh, starting with the pandemic, and 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 now, of course, with the 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 uh, with Ukraine. Uh, so it's 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 extremely difficult for these commit for, for these presidents to be judged in the same way that the law was judged. Uh, and I, I, I think this should not take from, the, from their contribution. It, the nature of the job has changed. Uh, what is required has changed. Now, finally, and then I will stop, um, on the politicization. Um, I think this is inevitable. But it is also true that it does carry risks because the unique construction of the European Union, the, the Commission is actually the most interesting bit of the European, it's, it's the commission that makes the European Union different from any other international organization, the WTO or the UN or whatever. Why? Because it has the monopoly of, of, of uh, the exclusive right of, of proposing legislation uh, and that gives it huge power to shape the agenda. Uh, it, it is also responsible for implementation and has real executive capacity. And indeed, growing executive capacity, as, as sometimes the Parliament likes to remind us through the uh, delegated acts and so forth. So the, the Commission is the element that really makes the, the European Union transnational. Of course, the Parliament and the Council ultimately are the, are the deciders, but the Parliament is at the end of the day a Parliament, and the Council of Ministers is at the end of the day a sort of Senate of, of, of member states. So they're not original. They're not. They're original in the sense that we we have them at the European level, but they're not. They're not. They're not original. They're not constitutionally original. The Commission is a unique constitutional creation. Uh, there's no. There's, there's nothing like it. I think anywhere in the world, frankly. Um, and one of its strengths, of course, is its commitment to the European interest, not necessarily to a partisan political interest. And that is where, in my view, there is a real tension. Uh, between people wanting to say that it should be uh, uh, a political commission, but what does that mean? Is, is it party political? So is it, it's, it's, we have a majority of EPP, so EPP policies will reign. Well, that's fine, but uh, EPP, not, you know, EPP policies or S&D policies are not necessarily what, the, what Europe needs at, at any given moment, and the Commission is meant to be the guardian of that European interest. So I think that's going to be a, a difficult debate. I, I do finally approve myself. Uh, I think the Spitzen candidate uh, process will be revived. I don't think it's dead. I don't think it's gone. Uh, and I do think that you can no longer allow these appointments to be made behind closed doors without a degree of public transparency, accountability, exactly the mechanics of how you do it uh, is, is, is open to debate. But I think we, we, we are gone past the point now where you can uh, do these things by backroom deals, even though uh, we were very fortunate that in this particular backroom deal that uh, we got President von der Leyen, and that's great, but there's no, and, and it's also, as we were talking about earlier, uh, the first woman president of the commission, God knows how long, it, why it took us so long to get to that point. Uh, but the fact remains, in my view, this is not sustainable in terms of the legitimacy of the commission in the eyes of the broader European public, and that's that's a, 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 an issue that is going to have to 
be readdressed uh, at some point in the future. So, uh, sorry, those are not some not very coherent thoughts, but in, in response to what's been said, but um, I think it is true that the law casts a shadow, but I think it would be unfair to his subsequent successors to diminish what they did at, at their moment in time with the situations in which they found themselves, which were quite different from those which President Delor found when he arrived. Thank you very much indeed, David. Thank you for those fascinating insights. Really uh, brilliant, if I may say so. And rounding off with big picture questions, which lead us quite naturally into a, a Q&A and wider discussion among the digital audience, which is around 90 people at the moment. And I'm delighted now to hand over to uh, Jutta Schulze-Holman, who's going to um, curate that discussion, uh, take any questions that uh, are coming in from the floor and doubtless ask a few questions of her own. So over to you, Jutta. Thank you very much, Anthony, and many, many thanks to our distinguished panelists for uh, contributing um, so impressively to this virtual historical walk. Uh, uh, you covered, I think, an amazing number and a very diverse number of aspects. So I think the majority of our audience is still digesting this, this wealth. However, um, a couple of questions have uh, reached me bilaterally. Uh, and I continue, obviously, meanwhile, to watch both the chat and the Q&A function and encourage everyone to use it. Uh, one of which is rather broad, and maybe we could kick off with this one. It reads, uh, how have the successive commission presidents interacted with the European Council? Which challenges occurred over time? Has pressure increased? If I noted correctly, Desmond, you... Um, said actually that uh, Jack Delors was, was rather successful uh, in, on this platform um, and, and you had a, you draw a very positive picture of, of uh, his interactions there. Maybe if you, I'm sure you can all contribute to the answer, but if you maybe want to kick off, thank you. Thank you, Jutta. Yes, indeed, I will. Um, as I said, um, Delors appreciated the importance of the European Council. The European Council at the time that Delors became president was still relatively a new institution. And it had established itself as an important institution, but he realized its full potential because he realized that the changes that he wanted to bring about would require, for instance, treaty change. And treaty change would have to be negotiated at different levels, but concluded at the level of the European Council. Um, and I think that the fact that there were fewer member states and therefore fewer members of the European Council was advantageous to Delors. And the fact, as I said, that he was also perceived um, to, be, to be as influential as he was. And in particular, I think um, Mitterrand and Kohl almost saw him as, a, a, as an equal. And so there was a triumvirate really within the European Council at that time. Kohl, um, um, Mitterrand and Delors, and, and, and Thatcher was, was increasingly sidelined uh, within the European Council. And moving, moving beyond that um, to subsequent Commission presidents, um, two things happened. <laughs> One is that the European Council became even more important, and most recently, of course, uh, because of the successive crisis since, since 2010. But even before that, there were other treaty changes, Maastricht, Amsterdam, Nice, um, the um, IGC for the uh, constitutional um, uh, treaty, and then subsequently the IGC to, to rescue much of that in, in the form of the Lisbon Treaty. So in terms of intergovernmental conferences, in terms of enlargement, in terms of launching economic and monetary union, the European Council really became the focus of, 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 of I think, a key political decision-making within the European Union. But from the point of view of successive commission presidents, it was a larger body, in which to function. The basis of their authority within the European Council was institutional in that they were the, 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 the presidents of the Commission. But the president of the Commission does not have a vote within the European Council. And the principles within the European Council are the national leaders. And I think this has become much more apparent since the Delors period than during the Delors period itself. I think some members, some presidents rather, were more effective at, at working within the European Council. Um, than than others, perhaps, but none had the advantages that Delors had. That was absolutely clear. We understand as well that both the challenges and the pressure must have grown over time in an increasingly complex setting and and um, dynamics, which 
surely have also accelerated and interactions that accelerated. Um, don't know whether any of the other panelists want to add to this. Yeah, maybe I can add, add one thought. I mean, of course, it's, um, I think a clever commission president uses, as you said, Desmond uses this forum to test the waters for initiatives and to build alliances. Um, it's, of course, a black box, so we don't really know, um, we don't really know what exactly happens there and how effectively presidents prepare the grounds, right? But one kind of anecdote which came to my my ears is that Juncker, for instance, that he used that quite strategically by also preparing informative, you know, like information sheets for the leaders on topics that were to discuss. So not just, you know, sitting in, but and not only, you know, having the conversations and the margins of the event, which which of course always happens, but also you really like kind of steering the debate and preparing information for for the leaders and i have i don't have a comparison to other presidents but this is my little contribution on that question yeah you did. could i um i think one of the developments which i mean i agree with a lot of what's been said but one of the developments is the european council itself has become too unwieldy uh, and is no longer a, 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 the, the actual meeting of the full council is no longer where any decision gets really made uh, and European Council meetings are, are characterized more by, by the, the, the breaks between the meetings are longer than the actual time they spend in the room together. Uh, and in that regard, I think the role of the president of the commission uh, has grown a bit because it is possible that the president is usually uh, brought into the smaller group meetings, which ultimately become the key, air, the key places where the compromise is brokered and then ultimately endorsed. Uh, by, by by the whole council. So this was already a trend, I must say, I mean, I think I stopped attending the European Council somewhere in, in 2005, uh, but it was already a trend then that you would have lots of interruptions of the meeting to allow for bilateral contacts. It's now become the, the modus operandi, basically, and you have the president of the council, uh, uh, the president of the commission, and a, a, a few key member states, obviously the bigger member states by definition, and then the smaller ones who may be more or less greatly concerned by the specific issues under discussion, who essentially thrash out a solution, which is then brought back to the, the collective for, for endorsement. But so the, the, the changing nature of the, the work of the council is, is also a fact, in my view, which actually gives the commission president slightly, slightly more influence. Uh, then was perhaps the case, I would say, say during the time of, of, of Barroso, at least pre the, the Euro crisis, when there was a, at least an attempt to keep the, the discussions in the in the council room. Mm. Thank you very much, David. Very interesting. I hear that Martin wants to intervene as well. Please just do so. There's no need to ask for permission. Um, you no, um, again, I'm, this is all broad brush stuff again. I do apologize for that. So I'm. I'm sort of simplifying things a little bit, but um, uh, among the, 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 the great pieces of luck that Jacques Delors had and to which um, Desmond referred was the fact that the, the um, Franco-German uh, alliance was ticking on all cylinders um, with this famous friendship um, between Francois Mitterrand, well, friendship alliance between Francois Mitterrand and uh, Helmut Kohl. Um, if we fast forward to, to Jacques Santerre, um, uh, famously or infamously, he didn't really want the job. Um, he uh, was sort of forced into it because De Haan had been um, vetoed, I think, by, by the British government at the time. And um, uh, I think, it, I, I may be wrong, I may be over characterizing things, but I think there was a sense of resentment there that never went away in terms of his interaction with what had been his peers until he was forced into the job, which everybody knew was going to be a job of clearing up in the European Commission. Um, then we have Romano Prodi, and again, I mean, I bow to David's superior knowledge, but Prodi was interesting because he had been Prime Minister between whatever it was, 1996 and 1998, but he wanted to be Prime Minister again. So he'd swapped benches for a while, but he never really lost his domestic um, political ambitions. And indeed, he did become prime minister again um, in whenever it was, 2006 to 2008. So he was a rare example of somebody who switched back and forth. Um, then we have Barroso, and I think that Barroso 
probably was the, the leader, again, I bow to David's superior knowledge, but the one who really did compare himself with uh, Jacques Delors, also in the sense that for him getting a second mandate was important. Um, I remember him going on the record about this, that he, he felt that part of the way in which he could compare with Jacques Delors uh, would be if he were to get a second mandate. Um, and that, in a sense, meant that um, he, he wasn't, unlike Prodi, he was not going to come back across the benches and become one of them again. And then you have Jean-Claude Juncker, and I agreed, by the way, with David, um, that, that um, he made, a, he did, he did a, be a much better job than the press um, he got. But this guy had been Prime Minister from 1995 to 2013. In other words, he'd been a member of the European Council for all of that time. He was like a bit of the furniture in the room. And on top of that, he'd been finance minister from 1989 to 2009. And he was also, uh, I think, president of the Eurogroup from 2005 to 2013. So I think that his relationship with the European Council was a very special one because he had been there for so long and had been one of their number for so long. And now coming to uh, Ursula von der Leyen, I wonder in a sense if history is not about to repeat itself. Um, as I, I think Desmond said, Jacques Delors was not a head of state or government. Uh, he'd been Minister of Finance, a um, member of the European Parliament, but that was about the sum of it. Now we have again a president of the European Commission who was never one of them in the European Council. And maybe, just maybe, because um, as we know, well, let's see what happens in the French um, presidential elections. But Macron and Schultz are friends almost in a way, the same way that Mitterrand and Kohl were. They're on the same side of the divide when it comes to the European integration process. Um, and one can see that both in the language of the coalition agreement in the case of the, the German government and also in Macron's um, pronouncements over time. Um, and so I wonder if we're not going to see a repeat of history in a sense. Of course, uh, uh, then, as David said, um, the problem is that uh, Ursula von der Leyen has had to face um, several crises, one after the other. But in a sense, to come back to the old Monet saw, perhaps crises are also, in the sense, going to be the making uh, of Ursula von der Leyen's um, mandate and of her commission. Many thanks, Martin, for, for these additions. Um, and indeed, I think it's very important to, to look, to zoom into the personalities involved, both the, the holder of the, of the post of uh, European Commission President, but also the, the leaders, of course, at the time in the Council and their interactions with, with each other. So that's a very important point. Before we go to the question on finance from um, a dear colleague of mine, um, I had a second question that, that reached me, and this very much is... Um, uh, refers to the evolution of, of the post and the climate and something that was partially answered really by David. So I wonder whether you wish to elaborate a little bit further, namely, well, the post has changed. The post is, hasn't been static. Is the law overrated? And maybe when we look at this, maybe we could take a little bit in the future. Will ever, every future commission president be compared to the law and will most likely everyone compare badly? Thanks. Well, I certainly don't think Delors was overrated. I mean, I, I, I think he did. He did achieve a great deal. I, I'm not at all sure that you will see the same conjuncture of, of, of circumstances that uh, combined in the way that Desmond described with the for, for Delors uh, for, for some future. I think the situation the the, 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 the the, the union has become infinitely more complex. The, the issues have become infinitely more complex. Um, uh, the politics have become infinitely more complex. Uh, so I, I think inevitably um, you are not going to see uh, uh, the kind of dominance of a, of a, of a, of a single person in, in the way that you saw for those. For, for those. And I would, I would tend to agree with, with Desmond. I, mean, I think. Delors' first two terms is is for I, I don't think he eclipsed in, in eighty nine. I think he I think the Maastricht Treaty was his last great achievement. Though he was personally disappointed with the Maastricht Treaty, but it, it was it was a single currency. So I mean, he had the single he had the 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 uh, single market in his first term and the single currency in, in his second, and that was you know a, a massive legacy. Um, 
it difficult to imagine anyone ever again, even if we have a constitutional moment and some great quantum leap forward, it will be difficult to ascribe it to a president of the commission because the the the, the, the whole construct is, is, is so very different and the commission will never again, in my view, be quite so central in what is in, in what is going to be decided. Uh, and, and that was that was the key combination of events which created the unique contribution of the law, which I think is is impossible to replicate uh, because just because those circumstances are unlikely ever to uh, bring themselves together in that particular uh, constellation ever again. Thank you for your further reflections. I'd like to put, time is running, I'd like to put the question on the uh, financial resources to you for my dear colleague Alessandro D'Alfonso, head of our NGEU service. He reminds that the EP has consistently um, asked for additional financial resources, reflecting the ever-growing number of tasks. Uh, in, view, in your view, after the establishment of the financial perspectives, which Commission President has done most in this respect? Who has achieved most? Just dive in, please. Yes, Martin. I'd like to cheat and answer the last question, um, which is, I think, if anything, the law is underrated because he didn't have all of the powers that commission presidents have now. He had to make do with the powers that he had at the time. And as David has brilliantly described, he did it a lot of the time through um, his, his determination, determination, a sort of uh, extraordinary charisma that he exercised um, and by um, using um, uh, brilliant minds in the Commission to brilliant effect. So I think if anything, in the longer run, we will, we will for all the reasons that David has enumerated, but we will also say that Delore effectively was underrated compared with other uh, occupant, occupants of the position. Uh, on, on the EP and finance, I don't have anything to say there. But the first part was very forceful. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, <laughs> Sophia? Yeah, please, sorry. Desmond. Yeah, sorry, I can't see all of you at the same time. Desmond, please. I, I was just going to try and answer that, that question about, um, about the EU budget. And in fact, I'm reminded, of course, that it was Delors who instituted the multi-annual financial framework and, and gave his name to that. And that's part of his legacy, isn't it? Delors 1 and Delors 2. Um, but I, I think subsequently the person who has had the greatest impact, I mean, the Commission President has to be von der Leyen because of the, the recent agreement on the MFF and of course, next generation um, EU. Uh, so the, 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 the COVID recovery fund and, and the coincidence of that and, and, and the inclusion of that in the negotiations for the, for the MFF, which, which are always difficult in any case, um, I think is, is a tremendous credit to, to, to her. It's, it's not only her doing, of course, um, because this is something that was thrashed out within within the European Council. Um, but I, I think um, looking back uh, at, at, at the July agreement of, of, of 2020 uh, on the MFF and Next Generation um, EU, uh, I think that would be a high point of the von der Leyen Commission. I agree with that. Thank you, Sophia. Did you want to add something? Um, maybe if I, if I may, I'm sorry, but I would also like to add something to what, what Martin said, because I think indeed this is something we didn't touch upon in this discussion. We didn't really speak about the treaty rights that have been expanded, right? And so I find, I find that a important point that Martin highlights. Only in the treaties of Amsterdam and Nice, the, the prerogatives are really expanded. And the law actually, I mean, when we look at things as you know, the, the rights that the president have towards the college, you know, in, in allocating portfolios and also the personalization of his own appointment process. Um, so we have the least of those during the, uh, for the law, but, you know, we have, we discuss them as a president that achieved the most, you know, and only as of Prodi, the president have uh, similar rights to, to or the, the, the most rights. And we discuss those presidents as consider considerably considerably weaker than the law. So I find this an interesting kind of you know, confirmation uh, of what, what we've been discussing here, that the leadership abilities and also the political circumstances are so much more important than the formal rights that, pres that commission presidents have. Thank you very much, Sophia. Um, I, I hope we still have, uh, can we overrun a couple of minutes, Anthony? Okay, I think that's a green light. <laughs> Feel free. 
<laughs> I'd like to look at the entourage of the Commission presidents a little bit. We know many things are a team effort. I think David talked a little bit about it and also Martin uh, referred at least to, to an SG. There's of course this tandem with the with the Secretary General, but then there's also there are also um um powerful advisors, of course. Um would be very interesting for our audience to hear a little bit um, how this this uh, how the, uh, has the choice of the advisors, the way they operate, the number. How has this changed over time? Has this been analyzed? I'm, I'm sure a lot of aspects are known here. Desmond, <laughs> I'm, I'd like to hear perhaps from from David on that, who who has such um, good inside uh, experience and, and knowledge. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the choice of immediate collaborators uh, of any politician is important, um, probably more so uh, in, the, in the, the commission, perhaps even than in a, in a national context, uh, because the, the, the European institutions are, are, are much more complicated to manage uh, by virtue of the sort of multicultural, multi, multidimensional political allegiances and so forth. Um, I, I myself, uh, and now I'm going to stick my, my neck out, um, I think the, the centralization has gone too far. Um, I, I think the, the obsession with kind of keeping things very tight in a circle uh, around the, the president and indeed um, uh, uh, with the, 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 the cabinets, I, I think this is ultimately un, unhelpful. Uh, I think the, the strength of the commission is I won't say the collegiality, I mean, yes, the collegiality, but it's also, there is, you know, on almost any subject under the sun, there is someone in the commission who knows it intimately. Uh, and you'd be a foolish person if you didn't want to draw on that knowledge before you finalized your thinking. And all too often now I find that there's a bit of a short circuit that it can all be invented uh, with a very small group of people. I mean, in the case of, of, uh, of Delors, I think it's very important. I mean, Emile Noel was absolutely crucial. And the way Emile Noel, I think I wrote an article once where I said, you know, there will never be another Emile Noel. I think Barton Selmar tried to disprove that theory, right? Um, uh, but I, it's our next event uh, on <laughs> the shadows of Emile Noel. <laughs> Excuse but, me, please continue. I, I think, you know, there was a time, the commission was, what, 5,000 people when Emile Noel ran it now. It's now 35,000 people with agencies and implementing bodies. And it's impossible for any one or two people to, to, to control everything. You need a more sophisticated system. Uh, and I think the commission is struggling a little in this sort of transition now to having, you know, this, these wide responsibilities, to, to wanting to have a strong political control over what is happening with losing a little bit the ability to bring in all the different talents and knowledge which is there and allowing that to 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 to, to flourish I, so i think the the commission has not yet found the perfect solution the why am i making this point about the entourage because the answer is very often oh i want someone in my cabinet who who kind of takes responsibility for it well yes that that, that can be true up to a point uh, uh, but at a certain moment, you also need to bring in the people in the services who, who actually know what they're talking about and, and who have the ability to really contribute. And the other thing uh, is that in, certainly in terms of commissioners, I think the multiplicity of having too many commissioners with relatively low content portfolios has led to people in cabinets wanting to run do the work of the services. Uh, because they're, 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 they don't have a lot else to do. Uh, and that, in my view, is dysfunctional because that was never what cabinets were meant to do. They were meant to contribute to the, the collegial functioning, but the services were meant to get on with, with doing what they were doing under the authority, of, of course, of, of the commission. So I, I, I think there is there uh, a challenge, but if I may say so, it's, it's the same at national level. Uh, if you look at any national administration these days, they are struggling with the relationship between the chancellery or the or the, the prime minister's office, their entourage, the 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 the, the ministers in the cabinet, and the national bureau and the the, the, the public administration, the, the, the full time civil servants. So it's it's the commission is not unique in having to grapple with this with with this situation, which is which is complex to manage. 
Thank you very much, David. And I can confirm that's the echo that we also received in the European Parliament that an increasing amount of technical work is actually done within the, the cabinet. Martin, please. And we. Yeah, Yuta, sorry, I keep sticking my hand up. But um, if we're mentioning entourage, um, then we shouldn't forget either that Jacques Delors was able to rely um, on a number of commissioners who did extraordinary work. Um, perhaps um, the most obvious um, is Lord Francis Arthur Cofield, who was the chap who drew up um, the internal market program um, and probably by doing so condemned himself to only getting one term as, as a European commissioner, by the way. But there was also there were, there were also people like Peter Sutherland, for whom um, uh, David worked, um, a bright young thing from Irish politics. Um, Henning Christofferson, a former Danish um, finance minister, um, and uh, they, th th I think that the, the Delors cabinets set such high standards that other cabinets, I don't know whether David would agree with this, they sort of try to reflect the same um, standards. So I think that was particularly true of the Leon Britton cabinets. In, in the um, second uh, Delors Commission. Of course, Leon Britton was another um, brilliant politician that was, who brought um, so much um, to um, the work of the Commission in the areas of competition and trade policy. So I, sh I don't think we should forget the other commissioners who were around um, Delors in his colleges and that he was able to harness um, and, and put to good work and, and indeed achieved so much. Um, uh, Arguably, you could say a lot of the legwork on on economic and monetary union, certainly in the first um, commission, was was Christofferson's uh, work as much as anything else. But of course, behind all of that were then all of the um, all of the, the the brilliant officials that, as David again mentioned, Delors was very clever at exploiting um, people like Jolly Dixon, for example. Um, or Adrian Fortescue in the area of justice and home affairs, uh, and uh, who did a lot under the mantle of Delors' um, charismatic leadership to bring so much, uh, to achieve so much in such a short period of time. Maybe one quick addition on the cabinet, Jutta, if you're allowed. You need to slowly close, Sophia, if you could. Oh, sorry. No, no. no, please. It's going to be very quick and we can end on a positive note because cabinets used to be these national enclaves and treated as mini councils within the commissions. And that is a trend that poorly changed. And those cabinets are now much more diverse and reflecting much more nationalities and also uh, professional backgrounds. Thank you very much for this addition and thank you all. It's truly fascinating to listen to your, your research and your experience. Um, uh, and I'm sure um, I speak for our uh, whole audience. I'm also happy that I can conclude that the title of this event has been correctly uh, chosen. Uh, the shadow of the law, there is a shadow and <laughs> no one will step out of it in the foreseeable future. I, I imagine over to Anthony for some concluding remarks and many thanks to all of you once more. Thank you very much, Yuta, and thank you very much to all of our speakers and indeed to everybody who's been online throughout this and shared in this uh, really great experience. I think the shadow of Delors has turned out to be a rather bright shadow. I think it's uh, still very inspiring, even with the passage of time. And we look forward to continuing the discussion about European, the European Commission as a political institution and European commissions over time. Uh, the next... Um, uh, EPRS roundtable that will be in uh, such a line it is coming up next month. In fact, on current plans on Tuesday, the 26th of April, we'll be having a policy roundtable on the von der Leyen Commission at midterm stock taking in the context of global turmoil. And that will be linked to an EPRS publication, something that comes out every six months in which we, we, we try to assess how far the priorities, in this case, six priorities of the uh, current European Commission are being practically delivered. But of course, those priorities have diversified both with coronavirus and now with the implications of the war in Ukraine. Which brings me neatly to the next EPRS event, and that will be next uh, Wednesday, the 23rd of March at lunchtime, uh, and it's entitled Russia's War on Ukraine, Policy Implications for Europe Today and Tomorrow. And we'll be delighted to welcome David McAllister, Chair of the Foreign First committee here in the European Parliament to give keynote remarks, and he'll be followed by three think tankers from the Brussels policy community 
and uh, three EPRS policy analysts who will look at various dimensions of the Ukraine war for what they mean for Europe's political agenda. But before then, it falls to me to really communicate a big thank you on behalf of everybody here to a great panel today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for sharing so many really interesting and stimulating insights. We really do appreciate it. And I uh, hope everybody has a most enjoyable afternoon. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.